I'm very happy and proud to be uh, with all of you, uh, my seniors and my colleague friends today. Uh, I'm very uh, honored and thanks for uh, my scientific uh, committee and uh, Dr. Monica for invitation. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Amr Ismail, uh, uh, I'm in a hospital, pediatrician and uh, uh, neonatologist uh, and uh, clinical researcher. Uh, I'm happy today to introduce uh, uh, our next expert, uh, Dr. Uh, Adam Kerton. Uh, Dr. Adam Kerton is a professor of pediatrics, uh, radiology and clinical neurosciences at the University of Calgary. Canada and an attending pediatric neurologist at the Alberta Children's Hospital. He holds the uh, Dr. Robert Haslam Chair in Pediatric Neurology and serves as the Deputy Head Research for the Department of Pediatrics. Dr. Carton's research focuses on applying technologies, including neuroimaging, non-invasive brain stimulation, and brain-computer interfaces to measure and modulate the response of the developing brain to early injury to generate new therapies and opportunities for life participation for disabled children. He served as the inaugural board chair and vice president of the International Pediatric Stroke Organization, the International Pediatric Stroke.org. Dr. Carton directs the Calgary Pediatric Stroke Program. Uh, Alberta Prenatal Stroke Project, the University of Calgary, Non-Invasive Neurostimulation Network, and the ACH Brain Computer Interface Laboratory. Uh, let's uh, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Adam <coughs> Kerton. Uh, hello, sir. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. And uh, I hope you can see my first slide. If you just give me a thumbs up there, Hammer. See my slide? Yes, we can. Yes, okay, great. Okay, so I'm gonna take about uh, 30 minutes and try and provide you with a uh, clinically relevant practical overview of uh, where things are at currently in the world of perinatal stroke. This is an area of, of great interest to mine. Uh, many other experts on this uh, uh, symposium who have uh, uh, relevant expertise and have um, will be sharing relevant knowledge with you, I know. So I'm trying to fit in the gaps in between those. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. Um, I will tell you uh, at the beginning about some of the young patients that I follow with perinatal stroke. These are two, Alana and Mike, who've been a big part of our program here. Um, just to set the stage that all I'm going to talk about is um, really from the point of view of the patient. What can we do in a baby with a stroke uh, from day one and all the way through to, these two are now young adults, all the way through to adulthood uh, to optimize outcome. And I'm gonna focus on the neonatal period because I, I think uh, uh, that's where a lot of this audience is coming from. And if there's time at the end, I'll touch a bit of more about the long-term outcomes and what we can do later on. So the main learning objectives are really to get comfortable with recognizing stroke in the newborn. Uh, I'll have you uh, learn about the three common acute neonatal stroke syndromes, how to diagnose them and manage them. And the management is really about objective two, that is what can you do in the first hours and days to optimize outcome by protecting the brain uh, from further injury. That's really where the uh, early intervention is focused. And then what else can we do beyond that to improve outcomes? So I'll give you uh, quite a few references along the way, please jot them down and I think you'll have copies for the, uh, of my slides. Uh, try to give you um, links to what I think are some of the best review articles and general resources. Um, this is a, a one that I like, um, and it's written by Mary Dunbar, who's a fellow with us. Um, it will uh, go over a lot of what I'm going to tell you. And the main point here is that perinatal stroke is not just one disease. It's a group of uh, very recognizable and, and quite easy to define diseases. What they share in common is that they're all focal vascular brain injuries. When you break it down from there, all you have to consider is uh, what kind of blood vessel? Is it an artery or a vein? Is the blood vessel blocked? That's ischemia. Or does it rupture? That's hemorrhage. And when does this happen and when does it present? And if you think about those variables, you can define these now um, perinatal stroke syndromes or, or what are really specific perinatal stroke diseases. And that's what's shown in the bottom panel here. I hope you can see my cursor. 
We're going to focus over here on the acute symptomatic strokes. There are some that occur in utero, in utero or are not recognized in the newborn. They present a bit later. But in the newborn, there's really three main types. And the, 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 the textbook type, the most common that most people are familiar with is an arterial ischemic stroke, blockage of an artery. We'll talk about that first. But we also see sinovenous thrombosis, and we also see hemorrhage. And we'll go through each of those three. They have a lot in common, but also a few distinct differences about how to recognize and manage them. So we'll start with that, and then we'll come to the common themes in objective two, that is how do you protect the brain after it's had a focal vascular injury. So how common is perinatal stroke? Um, I think more common than, than we used to think. And this is a nice paper, again, from uh, Mary Dunbar in our province. This is Canada. I know we're um, talking to people all over the world. Uh, this is our province, Alberta, here in Western Canada. And we're very lucky here because we can do population-based research in our provincial healthcare system. And so Mary did a great study that I think has really pinned down by each of those specific diseases I just showed you what the most likely uh, birth prevalence is. And if you add them all together, it's almost one in a thousand live births. So actually a, a pretty common problem, arterial ischemic stroke being the most common. And if you're more interested in the epidemiology, please take a look at that uh, paper. So arterial ischemic stroke is really um, uh, the most common and recognizable. This is a typical story. This is the MRI of a one day old baby, normal mom, normal delivery, normal pregnancy. And the baby has a seizure on day one and goes to the MRI. And here's a diffusion weighted MRI where, where bright is bad. And you're seeing a huge stroke. The entire left middle cerebral artery is, is, has infarcted uh, sometime in the last few days. And you can see also the rest of this very otherwise completely healthy and normal brain. That becomes very important for determining outcome. And when we get to objective two, I want you to think about all this healthy gray brain right beside the stroke. You can see this stroke really uh, dominated, took out the whole middle cerebral artery. But what if we could have saved some of these neurons that were on the edge, that were, you know, had a chance to survive, but they were unable to um, following this injury? Um, that'll be an important thing to consider. But we see cases like this uh, regularly. Uh, arterial ischemic stroke is the most common form of, of acute neonatal or perinatal stroke. And I'll just try to summarize where I think the, the evidence is at. If you look at the big picture, like I did uh, here, this was from our International Pediatric Stroke Study. Here's babies from all over the world who've, who've had neonatal strokes. This is an uncontrolled descriptive study from this great registry based at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. 250 cases is a, a good sample. And there's some general themes that start to come out just when you look at a large sample like this, that the babies are sometimes sick. In fact, most of them actually look pretty good, but they do, they can mimic um, babies with other conditions. They can have encephalopathy, difficult transitions. The moms are usually healthy. And as I said, unremarkable pregnancies. And a few other patterns start to come out. You notice that there's often more than one stroke, often in the other hemisphere. That gives you a hint about where the blood clot came from. And I'll come to that. And when you look for specific causes like congenital heart disease, which is a cause, it actually only accounts for a small percentage. And a lot of these strokes, it's very hard to understand exactly why it happened. And I'll go over that in a minute. Treatment is really limited to neuroprotection. And when we looked across the world, the use of antithrombotic or other specific medications is uh, very uncommon. So what causes a baby close to delivery to have a clot stick in the middle cerebral artery? We know that's the mechanism, that's what a stroke is, but why would that ever happen? And what I'm showing on the right here is a list of references if you're interested. There's about a half a dozen very uh, well done case control studies from all over the world that have tried to look at clinical variables that might predict a neonatal stroke. And they're, they're very good studies, but the disappointing part is there's never, almost never a real smoking gun. There's never a really clear clinical picture or setup for neonatal strokes. Very hard to predict. And so looking at all those factors doesn't really help tell you a lot about why it uh, actually happened. And you can imagine all those things we think about when we take a neonatal history <clears throat> in the NICU and you ask all those same questions, but rarely does it give you a specific answer. Sometimes you'll find a complex congenital heart disease. You might find an infection like bacterial meningitis that can definitely cause a stroke. But these are a minority of cases. And when you look at all the other variables, you rarely find something. And this um, 
uh, fits with an evolving model uh, in the field that suggests the placenta as a source of embolism is probably uh, responsible for many of these cases. And so if you just remember your fetal circulation, uh, any problem in the placenta, but imagine uh, an inflammatory condition like chorioamnionitis or a, a thrombotic condition, something leading to clots forming on the venous or on the, the fetal side of the placenta, so that it, when it enters the uh, baby circulation, of course, it bypasses to the left side of the heart. Most of the blood's going up to the brain and it will cause an, an embolic stroke, block the middle cerebral artery, or if if you're uh, unlucky, there'll be more than one clot, it'll block two arteries, uh, which, which quite often occurs. So this tells you there's a proximal embolic source when you see strokes on both sides of the brain. If the heart is normal, uh, where else can the clot come from uh, before birth? The placenta is, is a very suspicious uh, candidate. It's very hard to prove though, because the placenta is usually not obtained. Uh, as I mentioned, the baby often looks well. So can we ever get more specific than that? This is a study and the details here aren't important. What it's showing is that if you look using a baby's blood spot at their inflammatory profile, let's call it, uh, their milieu of inflammatory cytokines in the blood. This is a study uh, by Alex Maneko in our group. Um, you actually see some quite surprisingly specific patterns that differentiate uh, the different uh, conditions, which are these colored blobs here. These are arterial ischemic strokes compared to another type of arterial stroke, compared to venous strokes, which we'll talk about in a minute, compared to healthy controls, there, is, there are differences in this baby's um, inflammatory state. That's very interesting. Um, could it ever lead to a, a prevention strategy where we could identify at-risk pregnancies um, much more difficult? Um, one thing uh, that people always ask is, is this about blood clotting disorders? And um, we can't say for sure that disordered coagulation right at the time of stroke uh, may be a factor for some children. However, in, in this study, um, when you look at, in a controlled way, look at a large number of children who are a year of age or older, to answer the question, do these children carry inherent thrombophilic disorders through their life, you find actually very little. Um, there are, there's some conflicting evidence here, um, but in this uh, large study, uh, we found actually virtually zero association uh, with uh, chronic thrombophilic conditions. So um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't think about it when you see a baby with a stroke, but in terms of long-term testing, the need to test children who've had neonatal or perinatal stroke appears to be limited. In fact, we don't test and, and many centers are now not testing unless you have another reason, a, a strong family history perhaps. Um, so this is a, a, a recent change in practice uh, over the last few years uh, at many places. And lastly, don't worry, you're not supposed to, to read this slide. The point it's trying to make is that the interaction between factors in neonatal stroke is complicated. And so there are so many factors to think about, different types of stroke, thinking about the mom, the baby, the interaction over time. Uh, this is what complicates a, a developing a model uh, to explain why, uh, uh, in this case, arterial ischemic strokes might happen. Um, will we ever have a test or a, a specific answer where we can predict neonatal stroke? I'd like to think so, but to be honest, I think that's, um, that may not be realistic. Okay, so that's a, a brief view of arterial ischemic stroke. Here's another baby, but almost the same story. Term baby, normal mom, normal pregnancy, delivery, and this time a few days into life, let's say day six, presents with seizures. And I know we don't do a lot of CAT scans anymore, but sometimes we do, and, and uh, this was done at an outside center. And this CAT scan looks almost normal, but there's a little hyperdensity here. I hope you can see my arrow just under the left uh, lateral ventricle. That doesn't look like much, but it actually means a lot. So um, I'm gonna show you a particular case of CSVT, very important. Sometimes it's easy to diagnose. There's a huge clots everywhere, but in this baby on the CT scan, all you see was this, this little hyperdensity and there's one in the left frontal lobe. And if you remember your venous anatomy and drainage, you'd be like, uh-oh, these both drain through the central deep venous system. So you go and do an MRI and you find some soft diffusion changes in the same area. You find some little T1 hits throughout the deep venous territory in the left. You look closely on the, on the T1 MRI, there's something bright in the straight sinus. And you do an MR venogram and there's no flow in the straight sinus. This is a big, big problem. And if you're lucky and your MRI can do fancy hemorrhage sensitive imaging, you, you do something like this susceptibility weighted scan. And in those same areas in the, in the groove here and up into the frontal lobe, you see this um, backup and congestion of blood 
Um, all of these signs point to deep synovenous thrombosis. Now, don't worry, I know this is hard to see. This is, I'm showing it because this is a hard case to, to pick up. It can be much, uh, much more straightforward. So this is neonatal synovenous thrombosis, the second type of acute uh, stroke. And to recognize this, you really have to know your venous anatomy. So you have to remember how the brain drains its blood through superficial and deep systems into a common system and think about where that blood uh, has to drain. And so if a, if a clot blocks up that drainage, which areas of the brain are gonna suffer? Which areas of the brain are gonna get congested, infarct, and sometimes hemorrhage into themselves? This is often the story of, of synovenous thrombosis. And here's another one just to make the, the point, another one, end of the first week of life, a neonate with posturing and seizure, another CT scan, and all you see here is blood. So your first thought is hemorrhage, hemorrhage, hemorrhage. We'll come to hemorrhage in a minute. But if you have to look really closely, you'll notice that there's actually blood in the thalamus here. There's blood in the brain that has spilled out into the ventricles. And this is a, a, a warning sign for deep synovenous thrombosis. So a clot in the straight sinus. And if you do an MRI and you look closely at the patterns, you see some very distinctive things. You see these little strands of, of diffusion imaging all the way out in the frontal lobes. And if you flip over to the right here, the hemorrhage imaging, Look at these little strands. Uh, Linda DeVries, who you'll hear from today, calls this the iris sign. It looks like a flower. And it is, these are the deep veins of the frontal lobe. They drain all the way back into the middle of the brain. And in the middle here, you see little scattered diffusion hits also in the same venous territory. So it's a very messy pattern. All you think of, all you really see is hemorrhage at first. So you really have to look closely and think about deep CSVT. You do an MR venogram and there's supposed to be a straight sinus here in the middle and it's not there. That, and that gives it away. Now you know what you're dealing with. Okay. And it's potentially treatable. This is not a new uh, understanding. Yvonne Wu published this very nice paper now almost 20 years ago showing that when you see intraventricular hemorrhage in a term baby, of course it's different in a preterm baby, your first thought should be deep synovenous thrombosis. They don't have a germinal matrix anymore. This is not germinal matrix hemorrhage. And there's a big clot here in the straight sinus. There's a hemorrhage in the thalamus. This is a, a life-threatening problem and it's potentially treatable. So very important to consider. Still the best information is Gabrielle de Weber's seminal paper. It was in the New England Journal also about 20 years ago, describing a large cohort of neonates with synovenous thrombosis. The point is that the presentation is nonspecific. It's neonatal encephalopathy of some variety usually, so you can't rule it out or in clinically. So just keep it on your list of suspicion. And the risk factors, there's still never been a controlled risk factor study for this condition, but there are a few obvious things like babies who are very sick, septic, meningitis, those are risk factors for sure. Possibly dehydration, maybe even due to poor feeding. This may be why a lot of babies don't present right at birth. They present more like the first week of life. They've gone home, not fed well, become dehydrated. Whether thrombophilia plays a role, it certainly could. Um, so another thing to consider. Um, so these are some of the potential risk factors. And I'm going to talk about treatment about stroke in general in a minute, but to make the point about specific to synovenous thrombosis, anticoagulation is a very reasonable treatment to consider. This is still the best study I'm aware of from Mahendra Mohrier at SickKids, a large group of kids with CSVT, including neonates treated with heparin uh, or a, a, an anticoagulant. And it, there appeared to be much less propagation of thrombus in babies who were treated and a very good safety profile. So anticoagulation should definitely be considered. This is a, a snapshot of what was going on around the world um, several years ago. This is Lori Jordan's paper from the IPSS. And the patterns of treatment vary widely across the world. Um, about half of babies, this is about 10 years ago, um, half of babies were getting anticoagulated. I think this number has been gradually increasing as people become more comfortable. Um, you may need the help of a, a thrombosis expert or hematologist to get comfortable with this, uh, but it's definitely uh, should be considered. Okay, the last type of acute neonatal stroke is this. This is, it's usually the same story. It's a term baby, looks well, and starts seizing. And that was the story with this baby. But this time when you do the MRI instead, you find instead of ischemia, you find a huge hemorrhage in the right frontal lobe. Black is blood on this T2 weighted sequence. Here's another baby I follow who presented and crashed, almost died immediately after birth. This is a hemorrhage sequence, and I hope you can appreciate it. There's a huge hemorrhage in the posterior fossa here, squishing the brainstem. So hemorrhage is a major uh, life-threatening condition in the newborn. 
uh, that needs to be considered. So this is our third type of acute symptomatic neonatal stroke. The levels of evidence here, I'm afraid, are even lower. Um, uh, historically, they're really limited uh, to case series from single centers, uncontrolled, uh, non-population-based studies. They have interesting information, but they often use inconsistent classification. They're a bit hard to interpret. Um, imaging is very helpful for hemorrhage. I'll just show some examples here. Of course, the ultrasound, CAT scans, and modern MRI can really break down individual ages and types of blood in, in the brain. Um, so we use these together. MRI, of course, is, is probably your investigation of choice um, for the best information. Um, it's important with hemorrhage to keep in mind that some hemorrhage is normal. So a little bit of blood outside the brain, subdural, subarachnoid hemorrhage, is common, depending on which study of normal newborns you read. It could be as high as 30 or 40 percent. It's usually modest in volume and, and, and not a huge hemorrhage, not pushing on the brain, not doing any harm. But sometimes people see a scan and reports hemorrhage and everybody gets very excited and says, oh my God, there's a hemorrhage. Um, remember that a bit of subdural subarachnoid hemorrhage is normal. So what hemorrhages uh, do you worry about? Well, this is one way to classify hemorrhage. This was a paper that we published a few years ago. And I'll draw your attention to these MRIs at the bottom here. So here's the first MRI I showed you. We call this neonatal hemorrhagic stroke. This is a single hematoma in the brain parenchyma. It turns out to be the most common type, but it's only about two thirds of cases. The other third are made up of diseases we already have talked about or you know, that is arterial strokes, venous strokes, and global hypoxic injuries that tend to bleed into themselves as the injury evolves. So you can see this is in a stroke, this is a deep CSVT. That's called hemorrhagic transformation. That's what HT means. So if you see blood in the brain on an MRI, think, is this primary blood? Did it just bleed? Or is it blood oozing into maybe an ischemic or another type of injury? Have to consider both possibilities. What causes hemorrhagic stroke? Uh, also often hard to say. Babies are often sick with other things. Um, it seems to be more common in congenital heart disease for a variety of reasons. But when you look at these isolated hemorrhages in the brain with no other explanation, you look for things like bleeding diatheses or vascular malformations like an ABM. But in this large study, which was almost 100 newborns, you can see that's only accounting for like 15, 20% of cases. And so you don't often find a specific cause for a big hemorrhage like this, which is very frustrating. And it often leads people when they see blood to think trauma. I see blood, trauma causes blood. This must be birth trauma, quote unquote. And that, that can be a mistake. And so in this study where we carefully define trauma, it was actually, it occurred, but it was actually very rare. <clears throat> so does trauma cause neonatal hemorrhagic stroke? If you look back at those historical studies, most of them never even actually looked at trauma or had certainly had no systematic way of evaluating for it. I'm going to skip that. This is a paper we have that it will hopefully be published soon. It's just under review. We used MRI to actually quantify trauma to the baby's head using the outside of their head in a large series of babies with HIE and stroke, including arterial and hemorrhagic stroke. And the take home message is there was zero association between the amount of trauma imparted and any of these types of brain injury. That may come as a bit of a surprise, but it means that at the very least, we need to be very careful about how we use the word trauma and how we consider it as a cause for stroke of any kind, especially hemorrhage, which is where it usually um, people put it at the top of the differential diagnosis. I think it should probably be at the bottom. Uh, so why would a baby just have a stroke suddenly at the time of birth, a big hemorrhage, a rupture of a blood vessel? Honestly, we don't know. This is some research we've done about how twisty your arteries are and how perhaps that implies how they're built congenitally. And interestingly, in a large series, we found that babies with neonatal hemorrhagic stroke have a much wider range of, of twistiness of their arteries. Is that a sign that their arteries are just a little different and prone to rupturing? This is just a theory uh, that remains to be proven. Okay. Uh, the last, uh, I'm just going to finish with a bit on uh, neuroprotection. I want to make sure I don't go over time. Um, uh, I'll skip over this venous stroke. So what are our strategies for neuroprotection once we make this diagnosis? Well, here's a case that really highlights the issue. Here's a baby on day one, has a left MCA stroke, just like I showed you in our first case. And we don't usually do another MRI, but for, for whatever reason, this baby had one done four days later. And look what happened to the stroke. So it was pretty significant on day one, but by day five, it has filled out. Look at the temporal lobe here. It's completely infarcted, even though it looked like it was going to hang on and survive on day one. 
So this is the evolution of brain injury. We know it occurs in HIE we, and, and we know it occurs in stroke. It occurs over many days, maybe longer. And there's a, uh, I still cite this great article from Donna Ferrero in the New England Journal about the time course of neonatal brain injury and how, it, how protracted it is, which the good news is, does it give us a window to do something to, to improve outcome? So neuroprotection for the most part means thinking about um, keeping whatever brain is on the edge of dying and trying to keep it healthy to let it survive. So how can we do that? Attention to seizures, which I'll talk about, normal thermia, normal glycemia, normal blood pressure, oxygenation, perfusion. These are all things it's easy for the neurologist to write in their consult. Sometimes it's a bigger, much bigger challenge for the neonatologist to achieve in the unit. But these are the basic principles of neuroprotection that come from animal studies, adult stroke, and, and other areas. Okay, so we all know these things, but it's important to practice them. Think about them when you see a baby with a fresh brain injury. So what about seizures? Well, do seizures make brain injury worse? We're not gonna go there today. I'm not anyway, maybe Renee will. Um, I think of, of great papers like this one to suggest they do. It certainly guides what most of us do in the NICU. Um, but what about stroke specifically and how aggressive should we be? So I'm, I'm certainly gonna tell you just to treat seizures like you normally would according to best practices. Um, but uh, is there any drug specific for stroke? Of course not, we don't have any evidence. Um, so we follow the same general rules for neonatal seizures. How long should we treat is a tougher question. And this study from uh, Renee and Hannah and others showed a few years ago that the stroke patients when they go home um, are, are among the most likely to stay on anticonvulsants for the long term. They were some of the highest. Um, this is probably uh, not necessary. In fact, we've taken babies off now for many years so don't be afraid of stopping anti-seizure medicine early in babies with stroke. Um, and to back that up, thankfully, uh, thanks to Hannah and Renee and others, uh, this is one of my favorite papers from last year that really addressed the question that we'd all been asking for many years. Um, do you need to leave a baby on anti-convulsants, anti-seizure medicine, sorry, when they go home? Um, the answer we've often thought for stroke is no. Their study would definitely support that. Um, I'm sorry, I won't uh, Renee, maybe hopefully we'll mention it later today. Um, the point here is that if you take a baby off before they go home, the, the outcomes look very similar and the uh, risk of early seizure recurrence is very, very low. So very safe to stop and maybe not good to leave them on a drug through early development that just had a brain injury. Um, lots of uh, evidence continues to emerge. It's been there for decades that some of these seizure drugs are probably not great for brain development. Um, so you have to have a good reason to leave a baby on seizure medicine, in my opinion. Stroke does not appear to be a good reason. In fact, you're very safe to stop medication. This would be one of my key take-home points today. Um, uh, you should uh, seriously consider um, uh, stopping all seizure medicine in babies with stroke before they go home. Okay, um, what else could we do? There's a few conservative things. In babies with synovenous thrombosis, um, we had shown in a study years ago that their superior sagittal sinus may be compressed if you lay them on their back by the occipital bone. Lots of babies do this. So simple nursing techniques to, to make sure the baby has good venous drainage. Don't lie them straight on their back supine. You might actually help their venous drainage. Pretty simple, but probably works. What about true neuroprotection? In the past, that was never an option, but thanks to leaders at Utrecht, uh, Manon Benders and, and Linda DeVries and others, there is a neuroprotection trial now underway, which we're uh, very proud to be enrolling in in Canada. Uh, this was our first patient, this sweet little girl had a large MCA stroke. This is a randomized trial of er erythropoietin, which many would know is uh, under investigation for other forms of injury. Uh, the trial is ongoing, we don't know the results yet, but an exciting time where we can use imaging, predict risk and intervene in the first days of life to try to save brain cells. Um, a very exciting opportunity that we've never had before. And will that come with other things? These are uh, emerging trials in adult stroke and others with exciting uh, neuroprotective drugs that may come to our world of neonatal stroke, uh, but not yet. So um, I'm almost out of time. I just have a few minutes left. So I'm gonna skip forward to the end um, and give you a summary. Here it is. So um, to take home everything I've tried to tell you today, this is a review article that Ritika, who's a fellow just finishing with us, uh, we wrote, it's just published uh, last year in Neo Reviews. This flow diagram is, um, it is not a protocol, it's not telling you what to do, but it's some general considerations um, for a baby with a stroke, an acute stroke. And what it tries to do is tell you, of course, think about stroke, 
um, choose your imaging wisely, and then make the diagnosis. Is this an arterial stroke, synovenous thrombosis, or a hemorrhage? All of them need neuroprotective care and outline some of the basic principles there. Then think about the specific disease that I'm looking at. This is arterial. Am I sure the heart's okay? I should do an echocardiogram, see if I can get the placenta for pathology, make sure it's not meningitis. Rarely are you going to anticoagulate and you usually don't need to re-image them. It's, if it's a placental embolism, it's never going to happen again, right? The recurrence risk is almost zero. If it's a synovenous thrombosis, same thing, exclude meningitis, but very quickly uh, consider anticoagulation. Those babies, you will need to re-image to see what the clot's doing and, and see if it's gone away. Hemorrhage, acute care, very important, can be life-threatening. Think your tests change a little bit. Think, I wonder if this baby has a bleeding disorder. So you would do a few extra tests there. Maybe you need neurosurgery's opinion. And you may need some more imaging to make sure the hemorrhage isn't changing or, or growing. Okay, so just some really practical approaches. And then when you want to get fancy, you can think about prothrombotic tests, genetic tests, bleeding disorders. These, these apply across the group, but they're sort of your second line. You start consulting the experts to help you. And the last point is about um, education. This is everything we can do before the baby leaves the NICU. And I'm going to finish with that point and show you one slide. Okay. And then, of course, we're going to follow them up. Okay. And so what can we really do to improve outcomes? Um, the outcomes are uh, not great. Most children suffer lifelong morbidity. Motor disorders, cerebral palsy is the most common. So that's hemiparetic cerebral palsy. And that's where most of the research has focused. It's, it's where a lot of our program focuses that uh, I won't have time to share with you today, but there's some examples in, our, in my slides if you're interested. Only about 30%, these are the arterial kids, end up with big problems outside of the motor system, uh, learning, cognition, behavior, language. That's a big number, although it's amazing that two thirds of the kids actually are otherwise usually normal. They do really well, which is amazing. Um, and so we think about these um, outcomes. Uh, I'm going to skip through my few slides about how we measure and map the brain to understand their outcomes and brain stimulation and other treatments that we try to help kids to function better. And I'm going to leave you with one last slide, this one. So anybody who sees babies in the NICU who have any kind of brain injury, but I'll make the point here for stroke, um, need to address the, the mental health of the parents, in my opinion, right, right from day one. And I know that all the good clinicians on this uh, call do this, um, but I think we're learning uh, some of the details that can really help us to improve long-term outcomes. And so for stroke specifically, we've spent time with our families. We, we follow over a thousand families in our province here, and they've been great partners in research. And we've been learning from them about what it's like to have a baby be, uh, have a stroke at birth. And the overwhelming uh, finding is that um, the, the psychological uh, morbidity that comes with that is can be substantial. And we're starting to understand it with the help of psychologists. Taryn did her PhD with us and, and has developed this measure, if you're really interested in, in studying this in stroke specifically. But what comes out is that misplaced feelings of maternal guilt um, are the most common. Um, if, you, if they are not assuaged by, uh, by you as the, as the caring clinician, um, we often can't tell them exactly why a stroke happened and they, the birth was not what they expected and they read on the internet that I should have done this and I shouldn't have done that and now my baby has a stroke and I must have done something wrong. Um, in my opinion, the single most important thing you can do as a clinician is to take, uh, sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it's more, to talk that through with parents repeatedly from day one. And I still do it in the clinic years later because sometimes the issues are still there. A resource we developed is a whiteboard video. It's about five minutes long. It's on our website for free. Uh, I'll give you the website link on the next slide. Um, and we think it is really helpful. We, we're just finishing a study with Laura Lehman at uh, Boston Children's to look at how effective this might be and understand other adverse outcomes like PTSD. Um, but we're sure it's an issue. And I think tools like this can be very helpful. So please take a look and feel free to use it in your practice. And lean on community-based support organizations. Here in Canada, it's the Heart and Stroke Foundation. They can also be very important in providing uh, peer and, and parent support groups. So I'll finish there and in summary, uh, say that perinatal stroke um, definitely uh, is, a, is a leading cause of lifelong disability that presents in the newborn. And I think by considering elements of neuroprotection and um, the whole uh, care of the patient and family, uh, we can optimize uh, outcomes and we'll um, continue to strive to do so. The reason to do it is the outcomes. As I said, some of these kids are amazing. Uh, Mike and Alana, who I showed you on the first slide, 
have both become Paralympians. They've won medals for Canada. They are high performance athletes. They're both also successful young adults now. Mike's in business school. And uh, so these kids can accomplish big things. They, they're, they're the outliers. They're in, enormously successful. Peyton, who had strokes on both sides of her brain and is quadriplegic, is also accomplishing things. Um, so never underestimate the power of the developing brain. Here's those references. Our website, perinatalstroke.ca. I encourage you to uh, engage with the International Pediatric Stroke Organization. We have an upcoming uh, inaugural conference. And thank you very much uh, to my team and funding here and uh, for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kerton, for the great talk. Uh, very informative, uh, well organized, well uh, illustrated and imaging. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, some questions here, if you please, you can answer for this. Um, uh, uh, in your opinion, what is the best in neuroimaging modality for a stroke? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, good question. The short answer I would say is the MRI is, is the diagnostic modality of choice. Uh, it gives you by far the most information, arterial, venous imaging, hemorrhage, understanding hemorrhages. It gives you all of that. Um, having said that, there are good reasons to use other tools. Ultrasound for its ready availability, um, sometimes CAT scans, if, if MRI is not available, can also be uh, very effective. So I think you have to judge on the clinical circumstance. What do I need to know and when do I need to know it? If it's a well-looking baby who just had a seizure, uh, but you don't know why, you don't have a good story for HIE, for example, they should go in the MRI uh, soon. That would be my advice. And that's what we're lucky to be able to do at our center. Um, but uh, we're not every center can, can provide that ready access to MRI. So know the tools and use the ones available to you in the, uh, as the circumstances dictate. Uh, and for papers with the CVST and the coexisting hemorrhage, is there a volume of hemorrhage that would be a contraindication to the anticoagulation therapy, or even if there is hemorrhage, anticoagulation is still the best step? Right, very good question. And, and probably the most common question asked in this population. So, um, there's no good evidence. There's still no randomized trials, of course. The safety data for anticoagulation, which I cited, is overall very good based on hundreds and hundreds of babies in the literature, many of whom, a high proportion of whom, had some degree of hemorrhage. And in the adult CSVT world, hemorrhage is no longer considered a contraindication. And, and it's very hard to prescribe heparin in a, baby's, in a baby whose head is full of blood. I understand. It's very... Uh, um, that makes everybody nauseous when you think about doing it. The adult CSVT evidence shows that it's very safe. What's much worse is for the clot to propagate and cause more infarction, the chances that anticoagulation makes your hemorrhage grow appears to be, nobody can say it's zero, but it appears to be very small. The neonatal data is, is much less than that, but is substantial and suggests a very good safety profile. So many would consider it a relative contraindication. So if you have signs of active bleeding, uh, an enormous hemorrhage, increased intracranial pressure, you know, zero ability to tolerate a bit of extension of a hematoma, those would all be good reasons not to do it. Um, but some blood alone is not a, an absolute contraindication. I'm sorry, it's, that's a soft answer, but that's, the evidence is soft. So that's, I'm trying to fit it to, to that. Thank you for your answer. And uh, how late can you start the anticoagulation therapy and the sinoprody thrombi in a neonate? And what is the regimen for this therapy? Thank you. And I'm really glad you asked because I forgot to make a really important point on that treatment slide. The, the study I cited from sick kids, what it showed was that if you don't, if you choose not to anticoagulate, you may have a good reason. That's okay. But their studies show that um, about 30% of babies, if you don't treat them, the, prop, the thrombus will propagate and grow in the first, they had a standardized protocol then, five to seven days. So the, the most important thing is if you choose not to anticoagulate, make sure you re-image. Of course, if the baby gets worse, re-image them right away. But if the baby's stable, you should still re-image in five to seven days um, to make sure the clot hasn't grown. And if it's growing, then you, you should definitely consider anticoagulation. Um, there's no uh, specific number about the number of days. You need to convince yourself the clot is getting better and not worse um, to make your treatment decision. And do you have uh, often seen hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and stroke together? 
sorry. Uh, yes, sorry, good question. Um, yes, they can definitely co-occur. So, um, uh, and this is where the imaging helps you. You need to look for both at the same time. Um, yeah. it, it really fits with the placental hypothesis in that, uh, sorry, my dog. Uh, if the placenta is sick, um, it puts the baby at risk of both HIE and stroke. Any other questions? Okay. Um, and when you consider weaning the anti scissors in a patient with a stroke and focal neonatal scissors, if no occurrence after initial scissor? Yes, thank you. Um, so regardless of the semiology of the seizures, you, you said focal, but as we know, seizures can look like just about anything or we may not see anything clinical. Um, once you've attributed neonatal seizures to a stroke, um, the seizures almost always settle down within the first days um, and the first week, uh, usually by the time of discharge. And so the evidence that I cited, uh, Hannah Glass's paper, is very consistent with our findings and our practice here of discontinuing anti-seizure medicine at discharge. Uh, we've done that consecutively on over 100 cases of neonatal stroke, um, and I've only seen one child have a possible seizure a few weeks later and come back to care, and that's, that's not a bad, wasn't a bad outcome. It was a brief possible seizure. 99% um, of the children we've done that with have and not return. They can develop epilepsy for sure many years later. The risk is about 25, 30%, but rarely does that happen in the first months of life. And so to leave a child, the message, just to reiterate it there, historically, the way I was taught was, well, this baby's had a bad brain injury. They're clearly having seizures. They need anti-seizure medicine. That, that was very logical. And we would leave them on for three months, six months, 12 months, and they wouldn't have any seizures. And we'd say, oh, aren't we good neurologists? Look at it, my phenobarb is working. And I think it, it only took some, some careful consideration to realize that maybe that's just the natural history of acute seizures in neonatal stroke. The phenobarb was probably doing nothing in, in the vast majority of cases and is potentially not good for development. So um, I hope that answers the question, but just to reiterate the point that um, I'm not aware of any reason to continue a baby on anti-seizure medicine at discharge in the case of an otherwise straightforward uh, neonatal stroke. I'm sorry, there were two of you there. I didn't catch the question. So uh, do you prescribe aspirin for baby with ischemic uh, arterial stroke? Uh, no, good question. So for arterial stroke, remember the recurrence risk is almost zero. If it's a placental embolism, the risk factor is, is definitively removed. Um, the rare case um, of co complex congenital heart disease, um, so I, I mentioned it briefly, but a baby with an arterial stroke um, should have a careful cardiac exam, and most places will do an echocardiogram. The yield is low if the baby looks normal, um, but if you prove congenital heart disease, or perhaps a, I've seen a few cases of a, of a, a thrombus still floating in the heart, um, that's obviously high risk for recurrence. Um, if you have an intracardiac thrombus, most would consider anticoagulation, um, not, not aspirin. Um, and so there's, there are no clear indications for aspirin therapy alone. I'll make the point too, there's also no indication for emergency treatment. Sometimes people ask, uh, as most people know, thrombolysis and EVT have, have revolutionized adult stroke. Remember that we're diagnosing this stroke probably several days after it happened, even if you're prompt, even if it's day one. Um, so the idea that you could do EVT to save brain in neonatal stroke is not realistic. I mention it because there's a case report just published a few months ago. We wrote a, a letter to the editor um, suggesting that you could, and they were claiming that it had helped, and that it was really not, not an accurate uh, report. So both emergency recanalization therapy like thrombolysis um, uh, as well as uh, aspirin are generally not indicated anticoagulation for the rare circumstance of, of uh, cardiac thrombus. There's many questions out there, but the last question because the time is done. Uh, do you routinely uh, perform a brain imaging to the first day scissor of newborn, or how do you predict the first day old baby with scissor having neonatal stroke? Yes, thank you. Very, very good question. Yeah. Um, 
and to the previous question of HIE, so we, we miss this sometimes because we think it's HIE. It can certainly mimic HIE. The baby, I was making the point, the baby's attached to a sick placenta, so um, they come out acidotic and low APGAR scores, et cetera. Uh, many babies will enter an HIE protocol with a, an appropriate diagnosis of probable HIE, and only on day four, when we do our MRI, do we find the stroke. Um, but to your, specifically to your question, you have to use your clinical uh, uh, judgment and suspicion. If they are, you know, side-locked unilateral focal seizures, that's a hint. If your EEG looks asymmetrical, so you've got all changes in one hemisphere, the other hemisphere looks fine. Um, have a low index of suspicion and think about stroke. And if you don't have immediate access to the MRI, maybe do an ultrasound and see if you can, again, maybe you can see some asymmetry between the hemispheres. As soon as it's on a unilateral lesion, it's probably a stroke. And so um, in our, we're lucky here that if I see a baby with encephalopathy or seizures who I don't have a good explanation for based on clinical grounds, I try to do an MRI uh, same day. Um, mm -hmm. But I realize that may not be uh, feasible. So you have to use the, all the tools available. Just think about stroke. That's the key. Uh, I, I, I don't know, Dr. Monica or Dr. Sardar, there's still many questions. Uh, we'll finish uh, this talk or uh, we can continue for some questions. Um, I think we have to uh, stop because of the time yeah, constraint. Uh, we will ask Dr. Kreton to you know, answer them uh, either on the chair box or later on. Uh, thank you thank very you. much, Dr. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Kerton, and uh, thanks, Dr. Monica, and the scientific thank committee. You. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. I will go and answer as many as I can in the chat. Thanks very much. Uh, thank thank you. you.